I would like also to comment a bit, and uh, actually I have two questions for each of you, but I also feel I want to comment on what you just said about Anonymous, because actually I'm not really sure I agree with you, because I think that by saying that Anonymous is now becoming a movement, you are defining it, and actually how can you define it, something that we don't know uh, who is part of, and I think that also from the other uh, project that you were described, I think still the trolling component, even if becomes, if you want, uh, totally, you know, uh, incorrect, uh, is there. So I think if we risk to say, okay, now anonymous is becoming this, uh, we are perhaps doing the same mistake that you are telling them they are doing. So uh, trying to be part of the mandate and the political agenda because how can you define something that uh, actually is not possible to define because we don't know who is uh, anonymous. I mean, everybody could be. And even with the early Luther briefs that you were showing, um, you never know who is a part of anonymous. And uh, uh, this is uh, also what I think could be interest is totally interesting of this uh, project because uh, there is a total always uh, um, renegotiation about what is the truth and so I think that even if I agree with you that the political component now is much stronger and I would say also takes shape through the street protests and so on, still there is this moment in which we cannot actually define this specific entity and by defining it, uh, you know, I think you are also making the mistake uh, that you are telling them they are doing because you are uh, putting a border on the possible practice that everybody actually could do. Yeah, but to you, at least I, I see a kind of tension in the, in the anonymous movement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what I was showing in the last slide is, is really uh, the, um, a speaker, a supposed speaker for anonymous, uh, making an official message on behalf uh, of anonymous in the pose of a kind of news presenter. Yeah? And these have been the, the official mes messages from, from, from Anonymous. You can ask yourself to which degree are they actually official. Yeah? Um, yeah. But, but the, the symbolic language that is being chosen, the, the environment, is very clearly a struggle for power to say we are the official voice for, for Anonymous. And also Anonymous has um, um, operated through a number of so-called operations or campaigns, you could say. Again, there was uh, uh, an attempt to kind of channel um, or uh, create one unifying or centralizing uh, narrative uh, for anonymous. In that sense, I see uh, anonymous as much more streamlined uh, than um, other, let's say, multiple uh, collective anonymous or pseudonymous uh, 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 networks or movements that, that, that we are presenting here in this, this festival. I mean, I agree with you that anyone can put on the mask and do different things in the name of the mask and that this is happening, but at the same time you clearly see that there are, let's say, strong actors within this network who, who, who try to deliver one message yeah, and control it and then also uh, try to define who is part of it and who is not. Um, I go also to Victor and I wanted to ask you something uh, related to the presence of mail art because uh, uh, this is also a discussion we have been doing uh, some time ago about uh, how is changing my life to today with the emergency of uh, social network and social media. Do you notice that is uh, less participation or this is transforming my life? Because what is interesting of my life is that since it has never been really historicized, then it's still alive. But so what is today? Yeah, but in a, in a way it started changing when the internet became more widespread mm -hmm. and uh, uh, really I think the golden age of mail art uh, uh, finished more or less in the 90s when Ray Johnson and many other early practitioners died and disappeared and of course the idea is still valuable you can still um, much like um, organize uh, projects in the same way that has been done 50 years ago but even for mail artists it's much more interesting to see in which way you can mix the digital world and the analogic world and uh, do something in a different way because even if it's not been historified in the art the history books uh, except for certain few exceptions um, still you cannot repeat yourself endlessly so I think uh, 
um, Mill art uh, as uh, as uh, is ups and down as as a long history that is intertwined even with the. Uh, I agree. Uh, speaking of what you were speaking before, that it's uh, it's very difficult to. I mean, you're playing with fire. It's like with Luther Blissett. One of the reasons that uh, I've been mixed with the Luther Blissett people for like ten years, and when the sepulchre was done uh, at a certain point, is because uh, what. Uh, anyway has been a, a sort of artistic statement because the, the, just the fact that it's so surreal to have chosen this uh, weird image and the name of a football player there's a lot of uh, irony and, uh, and playfulness into it and at a certain point a group of Italian Luther Blisers was invited by Subcomandante Marcus to be the bodyguards of uh, who of course he was without a, a face at the time and uh, to escort around and the, the Luther Brice were receiving uh, from the so-called movement, political movement in Italy, they wanted us to uh, organize uh, what we should do to uh, fight uh, the red zone in Genoa and, and at a certain point we all watch into our eyes and say no uh, this is not more the sort of game we want to play and somebody else has to play the poli strictly political game and that's why uh, there was a certain uh, cut at a certain point because probably also when you have proved yourself in a way uh, you don't have to do it endlessly and, and like tracks you want to finish it you want but certainly there is this uh, um, is the same thing with live up the group uh, they're playing with the totalitarian imagery but Monty Kant in his front counter it is very outspoken the irony of having this flaming iron and making speeches uh, uh, in a sort of dictator-like way, but it, the game is uh, over. And if, uh, since the names are available to anyone, uh, what makes the disinformation game a very tricky one, and which you like to play, but maybe you get tired of it after 10 years, is that everyone, uh, in a while, somebody uses the Luther Blissett name or any other multiple name in what you perceive as a wrong way, you have to counter back with another idea. It's like when Mondadori Editore, big Italian publisher, smelled that he could sell maybe a few thousand copies of a book with the name uh, Luther Bliss in it. He asked one of his young writers uh, to write an instant book, which was Next Generation. And they put it on the market just uh, one month uh, uh, before or later that we publish our own uh, um, Luther Blissett book with the I edition and we knew about that because uh, on the background we had this information so we were able to include in our book a chapter where we were counteracting to the Mondadori book by saying it's a lot of rubbish that we have given Mondadori to have his name you know uh, uh, to give a bad name to him as a publisher but it, it's something that you every day you have to see what's on the paper and see now what should, what should they do and uh, and when uh, a project uh, probably becomes too diluted because there are no, ma no more thinking ads who are trying to, to, to steer it in a certain direction, that's when uh, probably a phenomenon, even anonymous, can go on forever. I at a certain point, it will be just uh, no more working as, as it should, and something else will replace it, like it's always happened. What I also find interesting, if you see this whole history, let's say from male art by Monte Kenson, Luther Blissett, Anonymous, that um, it's, it's um, a progressive detachment from 20th century avant-garde art history. Huh? So male art very much came, came from, as you explained, from the kind of fluxes uh, 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 background. The, the, the difference is also that I've been a neoist at festivals, you know, yeah. And I, I like have still later in the night to wake you up at yeah. three in the night and whisper something, and or uh, in the morning you say, okay, everybody's getting an early Arca <coughs> and it's going yeah. to do Arca to all of us. And uh, so there was also this tribe feeling, and actually, and of course, since things tend to become more and more digital, you don't have more anymore in the same way this uh, also physical relation yeah. between the actors of the game. But what I, what I find interesting that, that Luther Blissett was uh, no longer taking an identity from art, but uh, from popular culture, with a football player, 
um, and Anonymous was, was taking its identity, the Guy Fawkes mask, uh, from, from a popular comic, V for, uh, for Vendetta, which already had been adapted by Hollywood in, 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 as a Hollywood movie. I mean, they have all this occult uh, background because yeah. Alan Moore is like a sorcerer, it's, the, it's not a common uh, uh, comics right. writer. No? So right. Yeah, but but at the same time, Warner Brothers is, is in a, that feeds into your uh, line of thought with the uh, connection of um, subculture and business. Warner Brothers is actually earning royalties with uh, every Guy Fawkes mask that's getting sold because they have the rights on, 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 the, on the design. <laughs> I can to, to say something on this uh, discussion because time ago I was speaking with Simonetta Fad, you remember she has been also translating in Italian books of Stuart Thorne and she's a video artist and I think she really gave an uh, interesting uh, definition of this because she said that the avant-garde were really trying to bring uh, uh, life into art Instead, when we speak about this movement, this project, they are bringing art into life. And I think this is the difference, because many of the projects we are discussing here also are in the exhibition and not necessarily bounded to the art system, but is really part of the everyday life of all of us. When you decide to become Luther Blissett, it's not that you were speaking about art, you were Luther Blissett, you, you embody that and you act uh, under this name. And um, perhaps New East was a bit more connected with art, I would say, because some people were also doing exhibitions and so on. But um, I think that also going on in this path, uh, also reaching anonymous, we can really say that uh, many of these practices, even with punk, have to do with the everyday life. Yeah, and I think, yeah. What I personally perceive of anonymous, I'm not saying this because I want to say it's better or it's worse, but it's what is actually happening. It's uh, while in Neoism and other of these phenomena we have discussed, you can clearly see there are uh, art people thinking behind it. I don't see this in Anonymous because I would never have chosen that kind of image. Just because it's not cool, it's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but so probably this kind of networking strategies are it may be good, they are going outside of the range of the mm -hmm. artists and into people who are not uh, so much, uh, uh, I don't know, aesthetically uh, conscious of what they're doing. Yeah. Otherwise but they would have presented themselves yeah, in a more clever way. But um, uh, for me, yeah, I mean, that's one aspect, but for me the other aspect is also that of, let's say, um, the art system or art professionalism. Um, uh, when Neoism started, then Ishtar Kanto had the slogan Neoism Now, which he also shout, shouted in his songs and his performances, and then my friend Tentatively on Convenience, who has been one of also the co-brains be behind the Neoism part of the exhibition, uh, who had been in involved in Neoism from the very early beginnings, uh, modified it into Neoism Now and Then, uh, uh, in the sense of uh, the idea is, well, commitment to Neoism is not a lifetime commitment, but some people, you know, fade into it and fade out uh, into it. And that's also a very important difference with professional art, because professional art is all about building your career, building your portfolio, bu building your identity. Um, and um, uh, th then again, I think this is something I do, do not need to explain here, because it was what impressed me most with Yugoslavian and Slovenian underground art in the 70s and 80s, that... Uh, you have people, you know, they were doing stuff that was so much better than the, the conceptual arts, uh, mainstream conceptual art of the same time that <coughs> came from the West and, and was mainstream and is still canonical. But very often you see in their biographies, well, they did it for a few years and then they dropped out and, and, and did something completely else, I don't know, became not even in art, you know, became carpenters or, or, or uh, plumbers or whatever. Yeah? Uh, and, and I think this, this is really something incredibly important in, in all these movements that they do not have this, this basis of portfolio, artist identity building, professionalism, uh, which kills everything. Which is also why these, these, these kind of uh, movements or these kind of identities are most provocative, most provocative if you bring them into, into fine art departments. If you go into a fine art department, I have one at my school myself, and if you tell people uh, for only for this project, only for one month or two, uh, you're operating on a collective anonymous uh, identity. You know, you you will give them 
you will terrify them. Yeah? It, 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 yeah, no, seriously, seriously. Or, or you will get really strong reactions because it means, you know, uh, uh, the, the reason why you are in a postgraduate art program is to build your network yeah? um, and, and to build your, your identity. And, 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 and you're basically taking that away. This, this is why I think still these kind of projects are the most <coughs> provocative for, 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 for the standard art system that we have. And they can, the mainstream art system can have much move into, into networking, but if you look at something like Eflux, and you see exactly what the qualitative difference is, because Eflux is totally a career network. Yeah? And, and this is the way it has been taken. This is also a really important difference, I would say, to, to, to uh, net art. Well, who is sitting here? I think book, uh, uh, net art was the, the particular thing, and also the delusive or, or misleading thing about net art is it sounds like a professional art movement, but it really wasn't. Yeah? Um, it, it, it was about a, a similar di di dynamic of you know zoning in and zoning out into this kind of collective uh, identity. Uh, as net artists in the mid '90s, we were aware of mail art. I was personally <coughs> in touch with it big time, and also I knew a lot of. Uh, Lusablicit, and I was doing part of that in, in this country. There was a, a logical uh, camaraderie and uh, also awareness uh, regarding the previous intriguing networking ideas and ideologies. But what we also found very useful in '95, thanks to this crazy Dutch guy, Gert Lovink, uh, uh, was the concept of temporary autonomous zone by this bearded guy from New York. Uh, we all met in Budapest in '95 and we got a crash course in, in Taz. That was big in Italy as well at the time. Um, and this gave us a clue. Uh, outside, you, you know, we were all aware of, of the, exactly the trajectories in the Surrealist movement and in the Situationist International, as you described. And we also have seen, uh, the, the freshest example was a tragedy of grunge mu music, uh, the grunge movement that uh, got appropriated and uh, instantly killed inside the same month it appeared. So the velocity of appropriation and, and sudden death was uh, nearing, you know, Virilio's nightmares, like the, the uh, speed of light. So we were looking at stuff that could be uh, hard to appropriate and commodify. We were looking at personal strategies that would uh, help us avoid the traps of careerism and, you know, career orientation. And uh, what we understood as a good co conceptual model was Taz was the idea of uh, trying to get together for a brief period of time, achieve uh, something if possible, and then split before two things happen. First thing would be to get, uh, become visible and recognized and uh, become, a, become a poster boy. And the second thing, uh, before you uh, g generate a hierarchy inside your own little group. I, I actually think we uh, catastrophically failed in with these both uh, intentions. Now we do have uh, uh, a recognized pantheon of net artists, and also inside the net art bunch, not movement, not network, just a group of dots, uh, we can now see, especially in retrospect, that there is a hierarchy of some sort. Uh, so uh, at least I know that the key point is that there is a time dimension, that <coughs> each and every of these attempts is connected to uh, some expiry date, uh, and also the, the, the point of knowing about what people did before, so you don't, you don't repeat those mistakes uh, very much. Uh, we, didn't, we never repeated the mistakes of previous movements. We made them better. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Akin Bay was very, I know, we were all um, quite uh, um, knew his work, and uh, one Luther Blissett translated for Tastelbeck, one of the books, of his books, and actually even made the apocryphal apocryphal Akin Bay book. So that, that was in the 90s. Uh, you should maybe say that it was a fake Akin Bay book? Yeah. yeah. It, it's not a real book. It was written by somebody? Written by Monty Kansen. Exactly. And it appears exactly. to be Akin Bay book, but it's exactly. not. Exactly. And it was beautiful. The uh, attack, the conformism of counterculture, and exactly yeah, the I same. Yeah, I mean, that's what we should always do, you know, because uh, when it, it beca there's nothing that clicks and makes it different, then it has failed, probably. Any kind of action on a on a networking thing, otherwise just like Facebook. Um, Joe, so uh, I'd like to ask you, Florian. So uh, 
how do you have a career, make a living, pay for your rent, and continue to disrupt the shit out of things, and uh, you know, and be a transgressive artist? <laughs> I can tell you, as a university administrator. Hey? University administrator. <laughs> I bite the hand that feeds you, in other words. Oh, we tried with uh, with the companies, uh, with record labels. We tried all the different things, but then I had to always have a normal job because this stuff though, never paid. But maybe, uh, John, I, I should give you another answer. The interesting thing that is happening, um, and that's also what Tatiana discussed in her, her book. Um, one of the most, let's say, disruptive, transformative um, forces in our times is also neoliberalism. So what, what I see happening now is that the real disruption of the classical fine art system well, is not coming from, from all these subversive movements, but it's coming from neoliberalism, which is basically scrapping fine art. I don't think that uh, the art system and the art tradition that we nowadays have as this kind of Western legacy, mostly, let's say, from the Renaissance throughout the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, will survive this century. Uh, I'm, I'm almost making my bets on it. And for example, my school, because it's neoliberal, has already started implementing it. Uh, um, they, they, they say, you know, we, we don't, uh, our students no longer uh, graduate as, as fine artists, as uh, graphic designers, or whatever, but they choose to, to focus on either uh, autonomous, um, social, or commercial practice, and it doesn't matter from which department they are. I think these, these are the kind of transformations that we will get in the, in, in the next couple of years. And uh, interestingly, if you go back to George Bacunas, who has been mentioned by Vittore, uh, you see that he had very similar ideas uh, about the transformation of, of art into something that should be... Uh, yeah, he tried uh, to open the flute shop where yeah. you could buy with one dollar a yoko on a piece and so on. Yes. And he you see them work. Nobody yeah. bought it. Yeah. And, and more, <laughs> more interestingly, he had the idea that all success artists should kind of sign over their copyright and their identity to, to, to Fluxus as a publisher. So it's basically like a total buyout contract. Uh, and, and then it would operate as a, as a kind of uh, commercial uh, uh, cooperative, which from selling these inexpensive artworks would provide uh, um, a living uh, for all of the artists who were part of it. That was a great idea that I spoke with many uh, surviving uh, Luxus art, and they all thought that George Matunas was not <laughs> thinking about that. So they were not so cooperative. <laughs> yeah. But the business thing that you put on your diagram, uh, just that otherwise it seems like you are so miserable. And uh, uh, I, I've been collecting all these magazine uh, fanzines for, for throughout my life, and even the one I've done, uh, they acquired the value anyway through the decades because. Uh, uh, the Art de Postale magazine, uh, I was able to sell the whole collection to big museums and uh, uh, the single, I, I single things from the trucks catalog I sold to collector for uh, hundreds of euros. So it, it's not, uh, there is a micro economy inside even the most underground. Even if uh, money is never behind the intention, but then on a, on a second, uh, on the second thought, they acquire value anyway. And what you described as, as let's say, the, the principle of mail art shows, everyone sends, sends in work, uh, everything gets accepted, but in uh, return you get the documentation. That's also an economic model. Because economics is not about bar. money, it's about, ex yeah, yeah, it's about, it's about exchange. So, um, and you could also say, um, well, just like Wook said, there was a, in the end, there was a reputation system in, in, in net art. I would also say there was, was a, or is a, a reputation system in male art, only that it's based on participation and networking. Yes, what I feel, uh, and I wrote about this often, is that uh, when you send something to other male artists, you are not inside yourself, you are not thinking about uh, doing a barter, an exchange. It's still a gift you are doing. Uh, and that is very important because you don't think of art creation as an as a, um, object of value, but as something is a gift you have inside of you of doing that thing, and then you, instead of keeping it, you send it to someone else. 
then of course you get something back. But it's not so important as the fact that you are, uh, it's like uh, the uh, Red Indians used to do the pot trash, you know, and, uh, and then you destroy your own house because you want to go, no, it becomes crazy, but it's uh, what uh, I think has kept alive this sort of idea and spirit of my life in 50 years is because there is something irrational behind it. Otherwise, we would be clear of exchanging stuff. You know, like a, a little market is boring. Some other questions? I mean, I, I, there is this light, I don't see, but uh, so maybe I, I just want to give another input. Uh, then we have only five minutes, and I hope that still there will be a question from the public. Think about that now. Um, because we didn't really touch the discourse of the post-digital. And I think since you were also defining a bit what you do at the university, there was a part of your biography that I didn't read because actually I wanted to tell you as a question. And I think that you were saying uh, that you are now interested in non-institutional art practices outside all the new media, analog, digital, and fine art versus applied art dichotomies. And uh, I guess you are trying to go beyond the technological deterministic dichotomy. Maybe this is also connected with your idea of the post-digital. Could you explain a bit? No, for, for me it's very simple. Because, yeah, I explained my biography uh, a, a little bit. And I think, yeah, just like book for, for, for uh, many of us who had, let's say, started with these kind of subcultural um, uh, practices in the 1980s when the internet came, it, it, it seemed like the logical next step. For example, uh, when I was peripherally, very, very peripherally involved in mail arts uh, network exchanges, I mean, I paid shit lots of money for postage, you know? It made me really poor as a student, you know? It, it was, was a real problem, yeah? Uh, 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 probably everyone knows Today that, yeah. Incredibly. Today, uh, one of the things that uh, mm -hmm. have so much reduced the number of active mail artists is, of course, mo most people prefer to use the internet because it's much cheaper. It, uh, at the time, the mail was chosen because there was the most efficient and the cheap way yeah. to connect with hundreds of people. Now it's no more like that. Yeah, we started with the photocopiers, you know, in the, in the punk uh, uh, times, and, and then the internet was the even better photocopier. In, and you know, in you as we have these concepts of plagiarism and uh, abolishing intellectual property. Wow, you know, with, with, the, with the internet and then the pirate bay, etc. This became the mass culture. You know, that, that that was it, in, 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 a, in a way, and that, that goes all the way to, ima to image boards and, and anonymous. So in a way, you could say it was almost like a, a, a yeah, like like a logical conclusion that you win end up uh, doing stuff on the internet. But then, at some point, you see the limitations, and you see, you know, it's it's it has been just as monopolized. There, there are all kinds of strings attached, um, uh, all all kinds of, of, of problems that you are running into, um, and also. Uh, when, for example, NetArt started in the 1990s, it was very much about, for example, servers um, uh, that were hosted by artists and initiatives. Um, there was one here in, 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 in uh, Ljubljana as well. Um, and, and all that got lost you know, and ended up in the so-called cloud, uh, uh, which, which is, is, is operated by a few companies and a few, few uh, data centers. And actually, um, let's say, now that we are beyond that kind of revolutionary realization, now we have the medium that abandons copyright, etc., etc., um, then you think, well, in the end, this whole dichotomy, old new media, and about digital, it's not as dramatic uh, uh, as, as you thought it was. Um, it's, it's really not a big deal whether, you, you know, whether you're using a digital thermostat to, 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 to exchange stuff, uh, whether using an image board or whether you're making a zine. Both can be kind of different forms of tactical media. You can even have hybrids. Um, and that, that was something, uh, well, in, in my own research center, I had Alessandro Ludovico, who is also peripherally connected to this project um, uh, as a guest, and he wrote this book, Post Digital Print, where he came to the same conclusion that you know, we shouldn't see digital and print as like two opposites, but that we rather see them as, as things that, that, as touching points. Uh, and we're no longer in these kind of Hegelian narratives. Um, um, uh, this is the historical dialectics of the one or the other medium, but rather that we're talking about hybrid practices. And that's basically what this whole notion of one, is one about. One development which is quite interesting is that uh, in the past few years, the, uh, some uh, male artists have started to create uh, 
great uh, data banks uh, functioning, like, for example, in Denmark, Niels Lomholt, uh, through a grant from the university, has been able to digitalize his whole archive, and so now you have really thousands of mail ma ma mailings that you can look up, and uh, Georgi Galanta in Budapest has been growing the art pool uh, uh, website uh, to an incredible amount of, of data, and so uh, it is now so underground as it used to be. Even projects like uh, East Van Canto, Multi a couple of years ago, made a, a exhibi retrospective exhibition about David Zach, who was the man who gave uh, the concept of open pop star of Monte in a name. And this uh, really underground, uh, incredible, uh, active uh, male artist who ran the risk of nobody had told this story. And, uh, but there are other people like Al Ackerman and, and others that are waiting for some of us to make a retrospective uh, and make uh, a whole history of, of what he has done throughout his life. Mm -hmm. So the network also functions in helping the, the history to surface little by little.